In the 1960s, the state of Minnesota was in the middle of a technology boom. Propped up by companies like IBM and Honeywell, the state quickly became a hotspot for the growing industry. In the midst of the excitement came a desire to introduce computing to the local schools and engage with the local youth. State funding would allow many schools to purchase teletypes, allowing them to interact with university-owned mainframes and let teachers run programs with their students. Teachers like Don Rawich, who in 1971 was covering a Western expansion unit with his history class. He had been preparing a unique classroom activity to engage with his students when it caught the attention of his roommates, math teachers Bill Heineman and Paul Dillenberger. I'm just going to brush past the fact that three teachers sharing an apartment in 1971 seems like a good setup by modern standards. Bill and Paul had been working with the teletypes, and realized that Don's lesson, a game involving dice and cards that would put his students in the shoes of pioneers heading west, would be an ideal job for a computer. A week later, they had their program, and when the kids shuffled into class that morning, what they'd be greeted with was the start of something wonderful. The Oregon Trail, and with it, the world of computer edutainment, was born. Was that not the end of the cold open? Oh, oh, right, yes, I, I see the rest of the story here, hang on. Anne McCormick was a woman on a mission. Well, not anymore, as she had left the convent to become a schoolteacher. She devoted herself passionately to her work, constantly exploring new ways to reach her students and pursuing her doctorate in education. She had taken an interest in the young personal computer market, and thanks to grant funding, was given the opportunity to explore the space as an educational frontier. After assembling a crack team of educators and programmers, a new company was born. A company all about learning. A learning company, if you will. They sensibly decided to name it Alternative Learning Technologies. But they weren't 100% on the name. They'd get their first hit with the massively successful Reader Rabbit, and they were on their way. With the rise of the learning company, big things were coming. The children of America were going to learn, and they were going to be thoroughly entertained while they did it. At least, that was the plan. Oh, you're right, that was way better. The software industry in the 90s was defined by the CD-ROM. It could hold close to 500 times as much data as a floppy disk, and it could encode high-fidelity audio. The possibilities seemed limitless, and combined with the more powerful hardware becoming available, multimedia became the buzzword of the day. Developers started shipping elaborate, graphically intricate titles. Want to hear a bunch of musical instruments? Want to read an entire encyclopedia? Want to subscribe to a music magazine where you can listen to all the songs they review? We'll get to CD magazines. Just put the thing in the corner. It's coming. It'll happen. Eventually. One of the many use cases was in user interfaces. With the ability to use complex visuals and audio made it easier for more and more types of people to wrap their heads around this whole computing thing. Well, they tried at least. But, Microsoft Bob aside, the edutainment market also benefited greatly from this increased usability. Intuitive software was even better at connecting with young audiences and engaging them in some sneaky learning. Companies like Bruderbund, with their Carmen Sandiego series and Myst, or the software Toolworks, the people responsible for Mavis Beacon and Mario is Missing, started taking full advantage of multimedia. The learning company got in on the action too, of course. It was explosive. And as they exploded, new players started to spring up in the market. Humongous Entertainment and its colorful cast of characters made their debut. Disney launched their own educational software division, and it went so poorly that they accidentally made the Xbox exist. The market was unstoppable. That said, there were some concerns to be had. Striking a balance between education and entertainment wasn't easy. While some companies, like Humongous, focused on delivering developmental themes and stories within more traditional experiences, many of the companies in the field at the time were looking to pursue specific educational goals, and they often struggled to integrate their curriculums into engaging gameplay. There was a phrase for these struggles. Chocolate-covered broccoli. You can dress up a pop quiz in a cool CGA coat of paint, but it's still going to be a pop quiz. And kids could tell. But did it matter? These titles offered the promise of teaching your kid to read, getting them ready to start school, catching up on tough subjects, keeping them from losing what they'd learned in the summer. It was an attractive promise, and even though software at the time could be costly, many parents leapt at the chance to put these games in front of their kids. With time, surely the game designers would get even better at keeping kids engaged, and even better at delivering educational content. This was a fertile ground for future growth. Enter a man by the name of Kevin O'Leary. Kevin O'Leary, 
best known for his appearances on the Canadian version of Shark Tank and the American version of Dragon's Den, got his start in the world of business in 1954, when he made the strategic decision to be born in Canada. His early career saw him managing Nabisco's cat food brand, and founding a small television production company. Eventually, in 1986, he would start his next venture, a software company. With a $10,000 loan from his mother and a basement in Toronto, Kevin would found SoftKey Software Products, a winning name if I ever heard one. The software industry then was still defined by retail, because networking technology had not yet reached the heights of download speeds and white nationalism that can be achieved today. This meant that a good grasp of retail marketing would contribute greatly to your success, and, as Kevin saw it, would matter much more than anything else, including writing good software. SoftKey's strategy quickly coalesced around two core concepts, licensing and presentation. SoftKey would license, acquire, or publish as many different titles as they could, rent floor space and retailers to put up custom shelving and marketing materials, and bank on volume of sales with lower unit prices. By renting the floor space, they could make sure their presentation was appealing and prominent, and by licensing and acquiring existing software, they wouldn't need to spend the money to develop much software of their own. They could even lay off most of the talent they acquired, because the software they wanted had already been made. Better still, they could buy one program, say, a calendar application, and clone it with a wide variety of themes, each of which they could sell as a different full-price product. The idea of spending $40 on a calendar application with a different brand on it is frankly ridiculous, and it wouldn't stand in this age. Now if you excuse me, I'm going to go play this mobile game which is themed to The Office or something like that. SoftKey's model was promising to economists, but concerning to software developers. O'Leary would give interviews and talk about how what's inside the box is important, but it's not as important as how it's marketed, or mention that the market was no different from cat food or any other consumer good. What a nice nail you have there, said Kevin, holding his trusty hammer. Now, I don't want to be too mean to Kevin right now, I'm saving that for later. I will say, the decision to sell their products in general retailers instead of computer stores, at a time when the computing industry was growing increasingly popular with non-enthusiasts, was objectively smart. And switching from the big box to the jewel case in order to fit more product on the shelves, and investing in smart retail and packaging design, were absolutely the right business move even if I hate you forever for killing the big box rip to a king. The problem was that SoftKey interpreted the market as a commodity. It simply didn't matter if their software was better or worse than the competition, or if technology was improving and older titles were growing outdated, because they did not recognize a difference. Innovations in the cat food industry don't tend towards the dramatic, after all. There was another trend in the 90s that SoftKey had also latched onto. The amazing storage capacity of the CD-ROM can be used to store bigger programs and files, yes, but if you consider taking the smaller programs and files you already have, and just putting more of them on the disk? What if we could take the same pool of 20 applications and sell them in different combinations and bundles to different customers? Or if we sell stock photo collections, we can just fill the disk all the way up, and then we can advertise that it's got a bazillion pictures in it. Don't bother choosing which shots you want to keep, throw them all in there. Throw in half the photos from the last stock photo collection too. No one's actually going to use them all. Shovel it in there, who cares? SoftKey was on a roll, but there was a market they had yet to crack. A market that, in the first half of 1995, had grown by over $200 million from the year before. A market that would fit perfectly in their portfolio. So SoftKey turned its gaze towards edutainment. In 1993, SoftKey would enter a three-way merger with Spinnaker Software and WordStar International, two prominent productivity software developers. The resulting company, SoftKey International, retained SoftKey's management team, and shortly after the merger, Spinnaker and WordStar's development teams were decimated to save costs. In addition to WordStar's namesake word processor and a variety of other applications developed by both companies, SoftKey had incidentally purchased and dismantled one of the first major educational software developers. Spinnaker had been in the market since the early 80s, developing a wide variety of titles across various platforms, however they had left the space as the 90s approached to focus on productivity software. And SoftKey just killed them. In business school, they call this foreshadowing. The edutainment space was growing steadily throughout the 90s, and more and more players were hitting the market, like Lucas Learning, which brought learning together with Star Wars and a chocolate and peanut butter type combination that was sure to connect with the younglings. I mean. Don't you want to play Star Wars Math, Jabba's Game Galaxy? I see you know how to count. Mm. But leading the pack was still the learning company, which through the years had undergone a messy change in leadership and had grown into an industry titan. 
The company's founding members gradually exited as the company grew, citing a shift in the company's priorities from educating children towards profit and sales. By the mid-90s, the company's presence in the cultural zeitgeist was undeniable, even if they had begun lagging financially. Sensing an opportunity, Bruderbund, the Carmen San Diego people, I talked about them 13 paragraphs ago, keep up, made an offer to buy the company for $440 million in August of 1995. It was an appealing offer, and TLC was interested. Meanwhile, SoftKey had made an acquisition of their own, the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium. After the success of the Oregon Trail, the state of Minnesota had authorized the creation of a governmental agency to produce and distribute educational software, for free to schools within the state, and with a licensing agreement for anyone outside it. As the group grew, it was determined that its ties to the state government would prevent it from achieving profitability, and it was spun off into a private company, a private company that would be absorbed by SoftKey in October of 1995. SoftKey would apply their traditional model to Mech's product line, producing bundles and badge engineering titles into multiple price points and packages. It proved successful, and they were already looking for their next acquisition. So while the learning company was busy debating Bruderbund's acquisition proposal, SoftKey decided to make a play for themselves. O'Leary engineered a hostile takeover bid to take control of the company for- hang on, terminology time. Terminology time! In a publicly traded company, the board of directors acts on behalf of the shareholders to make decisions. A typical acquisition deal would see a buyer propose a deal to the board, who would then approve or reject it. However, control of the board is determined by who holds the shares, which means you can take control without their approval by buying up a controlling stake. Hostile takeover bids can come in many forms, but the one O'Leary used was a tender offer, in which the company makes an offer to the shareholders directly to buy them out for a high price. In November, SoftKey offered $606 million in stocks to the shareholders of TLC, and they responded with a resounding no. So SoftKey made $47 million of those dollars into cash, and with that, the deal was done. On December 8th, SoftKey announced to the world that they had acquired the learning company out from under Bruderbund. This deal made them the single biggest player in the edutainment space. But why stop there? It was time to swallow the market whole. The Tribune Company, who had promised to invest $150 million into SoftKey if they successfully took over TLC, sold them their new media division. They bought up Mindscape, the company that had made LEGO Island, and to rub some salt into a fresh wound, in 1998, SoftKey, having taken the learning company name for themselves, acquired Bruderbund for $420 million, after literally giving away their competing products for free to weaken them first. Hmm, that's funny. The stock dipped a bit. It'll bounce back. Much like this YouTube video on educational software, SoftKey spent much more of their time focused on business deals than on educational software. They had gutted the learning company's development staff, produced only minor updates to their existing titles, and spent almost all of their energy repackaging and bundling them into shovelware. But the numbers kept going up, so the strategy must have been working. And surely it would keep working. In December of 1998, the news broke. SoftKey was being acquired by Mattel for $3.8 billion. The toy maker had been trying for a push into additional industries, and educational software was a perfect fit for them. Mattel CEO, Jill Barad, was quite optimistic about the deal. The combination of these two companies positions Mattel for leadership in the changing marketplace, as technology continues to drive fundamental changes in play patterns, marketing, and distribution. As a result of this merger, we will achieve our goal of building a $1 billion interactive software business. Yeah, about that. Anybody who had been looking could tell that things were not doing so well at the learning company. Their biggest franchises had begun losing money year over year. Several of their more than 20 acquisitions in the past decade had been viewed by market analysts as poor decision making. They hadn't invested in the internet even as it grew into the commerce space. And also, you know, their entire business model relied on a fundamental misunderstanding of the market that completely kneecapped their future for the sake of present day growth. They were on borrowed time. Mattel had wanted to leverage their assets to integrate their IP into TLC software, which, let's be realistic, even if the company had been doing well, what development teams did they even have left to make these games? The company had been coasting off name recognition and marketing strategies for its entire lifetime. Mattel could have slapped Barbie on one of SoftKey's calendars, or some other simple tie-in, but that was all they could have done. And they wouldn't even have time to do that. Within six months, Mattel had lost hundreds of millions of dollars as TLC's earnings fell far below expectations and gradually revealed itself to be a dead tree. They fired Kevin O'Leary, who had already made his money at this point, 
and within two years, Jill Barad resigned in disgrace, her reputation cemented by the disastrous merger. Hang on, hang on, sorry, just, just gotta write that one down real quick. Mattel would ultimately sell the learning company to the Gores Group in 2000, for less than a tenth what they had paid for it. And where did that leave the edutainment market? Softkey had bought up all the big players, gutted them, and then allowed them to crash and burn. And with all the bundling and shovelware and repackaging they had been doing, they had made consumers weary of the entire concept. With the collapse of TLC came a blanket avoidance from investors, buyers, and software developers. Lee Banville, the editor of GamesAndLearning.org, noted the long-term effect of the collapse. The term has held the industry back in important ways. For many years, people making educational products didn't want them to be entertaining, because that would be called edutainment, and that would hurt your funding. There were games, and there was learning, but never the two shall mix. Hey, you better not be learning in here! Kevin O'Leary, the man whose entire career these days is, this guy is good at business, destroyed an entire industry, one devoted to the education of children through play, a literal symbol of childhood innocence, because he did not care about any part of that. His company consumed others like a cancer, stripping them of all potential future value and growth so he could chase short-term profits, and when things started to get shaky, he sold it off so someone else would be holding the bag when it all fell apart. In other words, he was great at business. His bio on the Shark Tank website, when it isn't getting company names and figures wrong, boasts about his development of the company and its sale to Mattel, and then promptly changes the subject. The impact of the crash swept much further than just the software industry. In August of 2000, a new show premiered on Nickelodeon, Dora the Explorer. The show would go on to become a massive success for the channel, but along the way, it would change a lot. The original conceit of the show was that Dora existed in a computer game. She solved puzzles by pulling items out of her inventory, the players interacted with the world by clicking with the iconic blue cursor, even the theme song showed the camera zooming in on the computer while all the characters animated like 90 sprites locking into different poses. It was embedded in the very fabric of the show, and yet, as the years went on, it all went away. The computer, the aesthetics, even the cursor itself. Was this purely the result of the medium dying? Maybe not. But consider this. It was funny for me to mention it, so I did. The story of this industry is so heartbreaking to me. At every turn, someone with a passion for teaching and creating great software gets pushed out by someone with dollar signs in their eyes. And it all goes up in flames with so much potential squandered. The children of the world deserved better. For his part, fellow YouTuber Kevin O'Leary did okay after all this. He would land his TV gig in 2006, broadcasting his powerful business persona to the public as Mr. Wonderful. He continued investing in a wide variety of businesses, and has appeared in all sorts of media. He even decided to run for the leader of the Canadian Conservative Party in 2017. But the world was not ready for a second businessman turned TV businessman turned politician, apparently. As the years went on, the wound would begin to heal. Al Gore had taken the initiative in creating the internet, and as the new millennium approached, the technology landscape began to radically change once again. By the 2000s, the industry was entirely new. Adobe Flash swept the world as the barrier to entry to create multimedia content lowered, and this led to many educational Flash games, focusing on a variety of subjects. When it came to commercial software, however, the rift between education and entertainment was wider than it had ever been. Where educational children's software did exist, it made it very clear that there was going to be broccoli under that chocolate. Subscription services promising to give your kids a leg up in school became the norm. Disney's Preschool Time Online, ABC Mouse, Adventure Academy, and plenty more would spring up with time. Companies like Leapfrog and VTech found success with educational gaming hardware, sidestepping the home computer entirely. On the other end of the spectrum, the video game industry at large went through its own indie boom in the 2010s. Digital distribution and off-the-shelf game engines made it easy for weirder, nerdier games to find their niche. And it didn't take long for the public to notice how much learning the audiences for some of these games happened to be doing. Eventually, this realization gave us Teacher Gaming, a company that took existing games with teachable principles and reinvented them into new educational contexts. A true edutainment revival. They received a lot of media attention for their work with games like Minecraft and Kerbal Space Program, but in 2021, they discontinued their flagship subscription service due to financial concerns. A true edutainment revival. One place where more success has existed is the smartphone market, which essentially superseded Flash in terms of format. Anne McCormick herself went on to create Reader B, an educational mobile game series of her own design. And all our old favorite nostalgic characters from the era have made their comebacks, repackaged and re-released for modern platforms endlessly. Because nobody learns their lessons in the world of business. 
Carmen Sandiego even got a Netflix series. And amazingly, it was good. All told, we're left with a fitting end. The entertainment industry collapsed, and what can we do with that but learn from it? When we consider the history of this industry, we can explore the dangers that come with the dispassionate financialization of all things. We can appreciate the change to the landscape of the business world that was brought up by the wave of hostile takeovers and big-name corporate raiders in the 90s. We can look back at the ways we thought to integrate technology into education back then and compare it to how we've come to do it today. A brave video essayist might try to make a point about capitalism right now. <coughs> it's funny. We think of powerful business people like they're these ruthless, cutthroat competitors. They'll rip you apart to get to the top. We call them things like tigers or dragons or sharks. But I think that last one's a more apt analogy than it might seem. Because not every shark has the ability to pump water into its gills on its own. They have to keep moving constantly in order to stay alive. And in the world of business, it's not ruthlessness that keeps you going. It's change. You stay still for too long, you coast on the successes of yesterday, you don't plan for tomorrow, and you're going to go belly up eventually. But hey, you might get a TV gig out of it. Come on,